Thanks, Michael. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and having to have a talk about um, sulfur dioxide, which is definitely one of the most common things that we deal with in wine, <coughs> but in real terms is probably one of the more misunderstood little beasties out there. So let's get into it. I'm going to try to keep on to time for our 20 minutes, but it's a big topic, so forgive me if I go a little over. So what is SO2? Um, sulfur dioxide, it's a very simple molecule, sulfur with two oxygens. Um, it's quite common, it's um, very, very common outside of the wine industry. It's one of the more common preservatives. It's got the E number of 220, but there's a few variations on that as well. And it's not a new thing. It's been used in wine since Roman times um, through burning of sulfur and you know, it's for a very, very long people time, people have known that you can preserve wine and a lot of other food groups using sulfur dioxide. It's got two main roles in wine. It's an antimicrobial, so it helps stop the growth of yeast, fungi and other groups of bugs, if you like, and it's also an antioxidant. Now, just going to put in a quick um, bit of information that everyone seems to miss in this is that sulfur dioxide does not react with oxygen, not directly. It's, um, it's part of a cascade, part of a chain. So one of the things that we need people to understand, because it does become really important, is that you're not getting SO2 reacting with oxygen, you're getting SO2 reacting with the products of oxygen interacting with wine and stopping a cascade or a chain reaction. But more about that a bit later. And the other thing that I think is probably pretty important for everyone to know or realise if they don't already is that it's the most common test we do in wine. So if I had to pick the test that was done most regularly and that even the smallest wineries try to set up to do, it would be SO2. So it's um, very important, it's very commonly done and in general done reasonably well at least in the Australian wine industry. Now, a little chemistry, which we can't avoid, especially since I'm a chemist. In solution, it exists in three main forms, and they're in an equilibrium. So we've got SO2, or the molecular sulfur dioxide, as we showed on the first slide. But when you add that to water, it interacts to form bisulfite, which is a molecule where you've added a hydrogen and an oxygen, and it's got a negative charge. Now, there's also another, as you go along, another form that it is in equilibrium, which is sulfite, which is just the SO32 minus, so you don't have any of the um, extra hydrogen ions involved. But that's really not an issue in wine. And so to give you an idea why, if we have a quick look at, this is what they call a distribution, species distribution. And the bottom axis of this is pH, so we're going from 0 to 10 pH. And at wine pHs, pretty well everything's there in the form of bisulfite. So 92 to 99% exists as the HSO3 minus form. There's also a little bit of uh, molecular SO2 there, which is really important. But in real terms, we don't have to worry about sulfite, SO3 2 minus, in wine. So we're worried about bisulfite and molecular. And probably the other thing that's really important to keep there is, if you look at those graphs, you can see between three and four, the proportions of molecular change quite drastically from almost nothing at pH 4 up to a few percent at pH 3. And that's incredibly important because as wine pH changes, the actual amount of each of the forms change and the different forms have different functions. So what versions do what? Well, molecular sulfur is the bit that we worried about for the antimicrobial thing. So if you're trying to stop microbial growth, you've got to worry about the molecular part of the process. If you're trying, now this is really important because if we go back to what we were just talking about, if you have a very high pH wine, you'll have next to no molecular, so you need to have an awful lot of 
um, total sulfur around to actually get enough molecular to do anything. Molecular also gets involved with the reaction with um, hydrogen peroxide, but by far more important for that is the bisulfite form. Now, remember I said earlier that um, oxygen and sulfur dioxide don't interact directly. What one of the main outcomes of oxygen's interactions with um, the nolix in wine is the production of H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide, which is what does an awful lot of the damage. It's not all the damage, there's a fair bit more to it, but SO2 is really, really good, or bisulfite and molecular sulfite, sulfur dioxide, is really good at mopping up the H2O2 so you stop further reactions going on. It also gets in, it's the form that gets involved in binding and an addition reaction, so tying up with acetaldehyde and things like that. It inhibits the formation of brown pigments, which is tied up with this H2O2 thing, and inactivation effects phenyl oxidases, in other words, the things that are leading to the browning, and tied up in a similar way, it reacts with quinones. Um, and that's that reaction you see down in the bottom. And that's a really, really important reaction because that's the, the core of what's happening when oxygen um, reacts with wine because it's lots of these phenolics are available in wine and they're the things that get involved in browning and formation of um, bad tasting compounds, etc. So getting SO2 to react with those things has, is quite important. But of course, that's the story if we were doing things in um, water at the pH of wine. In wine, it gets a little bit more complicated because wine's a pretty complicated beast. The bisulfite anion, so that HSO3 minus, reacts with things like carbonyls, especially acetaldehyde. Now, this is a reversible reaction, okay? but it is one of the ways that we end up tying up an awful lot of um, sulfur dioxide. It also reacts with anything that's by definition a carbonyl, and so that includes a lot of our colour forming compounds, so the bleaching effect we talk about with anthocyanins, when you add um, sulfur dioxide to a red for instance, is because you get loose binding or reactions of the SO2 with the colour compound, like an anthocyanin, as you see in front of you, and that A changes the colour, but also takes away some of the SO2 from being easily available. But the bit we need to remember with this is those reactions with um, things like colour compounds are very um, weak in general, and so you have an equilibrium going on where if you get the SO2 back as the bisulfite quite easily. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, essentially it means we've got two kinds of SO2 in wine. We have free SO2, which is the stuff that's in solution as either um, sulfur dioxide, bisulfite, or sulfite. And then we have all the stuff that's bound, and it can be bound to acetaldehyde, as we said, phenolics, colour, and to a certain extent, sugars. Unfortunately, it's not, well, the first thing is, yeah, so we have free and bound, and when we talk about total sulfur dioxide, which is for legal reasons, um, what we have to have a num knowledge of, because all the legal limits for sulfur dioxide are defined as totals, we talk about the combination of free and bound, okay? So we need to know both of those in there. But in wine, the unfortunate thing is it's not this cut and dry bit we think about SO2 t tied up to acetaldehyde or acetaldehyde is nice and strongly bound and it's pretty easily defined. Most of the stuff that's in the free is easily defined as free, but things bound up to colour and sugar and phenolics live in a bit of a grey region. And so when we talk about the difference between free and bound in wine, and especially red wines which have much higher levels of phenolics, it's a little bit more grey what's bound and what's unbound. Um, doesn't cause us too much grief, and we can 
the tests we use give us a pretty good indication of that. But you just need to always remember that when you're looking at wines with lots of phenolics or lots of sugars, some of that th stuff that you would like to think is going to be free is going to be tied up. Now a quick note, and this is um, something that's become <coughs> more and more important to wines around the world these days as we understand the chemistry a lot better, is that none of the oxidation chemistry that we talk about that we're trying to prevent using SO2 takes place without the presence of some metal ions. Specifically in wine we worry about iron and copper. And so once again this comes down to the fact that SO2 can't react with oxygen directly. You need to make have other things there to uh, help it along if you like. And you know, there's been some great work done which has shown how important this is. You really don't get into the detail of this one too well, although if you're um, into complicated chemistry papers, I, so I encourage you to go and have a look at this paper by Danilowitz from 2007. But the graph at the top A is a model wine where there is absolutely no uh, metals in it and he pumped a lot of oxygen into it and mixed it up and showed saw no reaction. Whereas if you go down to G where he's got um, both iron and copper in reasonable amounts, you can see that there's a big drop off of sulphur dioxide um, over time. And this happens in wine as well. It's, um, this is just a quick um, image from a trial we did in some Chardonnay where we could see that the more copper we had in the wine, so that's what's in the bottom scale there is the amount of copper, the more SO2 that disappears. So it's a real thing that we see in wines. Most wines have some levels of iron or copper in them no matter what, so it's there, but especially copper, the more we have, it tends to give greater drop off of SO2 or more quick drop off of SO2. Now the reasons for this are incredibly complicated. I'm not trying to be facetious, it's just it's chemistry that's got new papers coming out all the time and if you have a look at this um, reaction scheme from another Danilowitz paper from 2014, you can see there's a lot going on when you talk about how oxygen's interacting with wine components. But the important bit to see there is um, bisulfite plays a little role, well plays a role, appears down the chain through there. But for everything to happen, you need copper and iron. Okay, you can get away with iron just by itself, but copper makes it happen much more easily. So all this chemistry is required. The other thing that's important is these phenolics that are very important in the process. Um, they're there; they have a big role to play, and we should need to know about them in as part of the process. Now that's as hard as the chemistry is going to get today. That's a really complicated slide and I don't think I'll talk about it anymore. But the take home from it is that metals and phenolics play a really, really big part in how SO2 um, does its job in wine. So how do we test for SO2? Um, there are four common methods. The one that we see in Australia most of, often is aeration oxidation. Lots of people will call it something like the um, Rankin method. Um, we tend to call it the aeration oxidation method because that's the, what it is and how it works. Um, Bryce Rankin did some great work in modifying the method and um, defining the best ways of doing it. We also see the Ripper method, which is an iodic titration. Um, we don't recommend that in Australia in general because it has a lot of interference for red wines in particular, but it does work for white wines quite well. It's quick of aeration oxidation, but yeah, there are more interferences involved and you've just got to know that if you're going to use it. Um, there are flow analytical techniques where you can buy relatively expensive machines, do lots of sulfurs quite quickly. They basically tend to work by reacting a dye with the reagents in the wine, but they're very expensive to set up and you really need to be doing um, 50 to 100 sulfurs a day to justify them, or actually even more than that. And there are new um, tests which are being marketed at the moment to be used on enzymatic automated testers, so you can use with, you know, those robotic spectrometers if you like, um, 
we're still learning a bit about how well they work and what the problems are with them and what works with them, but there's a lot of people feeling that they're showing a lot of promise and um, we'll probably see a lot more wineries move down that path since so many wineries are measuring things like sugars and malic using the same equipment. Um, so that, they're the main ways of testing it, but before we get on to talking about any of those testing methods, a few things we need to remember. And the first one is molecular. We can't actually easily in a winery measure molecular. So what we do is we calculate how much is there from the pH and the free SO2. Now that's given by that complicated equation there. I don't recommend anyone sort of starts trying to do that on a regular basis. The quickest and easiest way to do it, and yes, this is a free plug, is using the AWRI um, calculator app, which is available for Android and um, Android and iPhones, and is also available on our website. There, if you do feel the need to calculate it a bit more, do it in a spreadsheet. That's your set, typical equation that you use to set it up through there, um, or print out a table to do it. Um, that chart shows you know the pH and the free SO2 you need at the two to get the two common moleculars that we use. Or you can build a table and put that in there. It's again not a, not hard to do in a spreadsheet. So that's how you do molecular. I'm only going to I'm going to give a really brief description of the aeration and oxidation method so that people really do try to understand how it works. I won't be talking about any of the other analytical methods because we don't have time. But essentially if you've got the aeration oxidation setup done, what you're doing is you acidify the sample. So you take your wine sample and you chuck in some acid and that changes that equilibrium to force nearly all the SO2 that's not bound up into the molecular form. And once it's there as the molecular form, when you push a stream of air through it, the SO2 will get picked up by the air and carried through your condenser and you bubble it into a hydrogen and peroxide solution. As we said earlier, SO2 reacts really, really quickly with hydrogen peroxide to form sulfuric acid. And what we do next is then we take that um, solution of peroxide with sulfuric acid in it and we titrate it against sodium hydroxide. And the, the titration between sulfuric acid and um, sodium hydroxide is really simple. We use a colour um, indicator to see where the change is. And by knowing the amount of um, SO, H2SO4, or sulfuric acid, that we've generated, we can reverse the calculation to work out how much SO2 we originally had, and that tells us what's there. So it's a really simple thing where we're first converting that, um, all the SO2 we can into a form that we can suck out of the wine by making lowering the pH, and then we push it into a solution that converts it into something we can measure. It's not that bad. Now the bound SO2 we actually do by <coughs> pardon me. We actually do by exactly the same method, but to actually break the the bonds that um, are linking up the SO2 to things like acetaldehyde and colours, etc., we heat it up. Now we don't boil it but we heat it up, that breaks those bonds, especially in the acidic solution, and once again, the stream of air can carry it across and we can measure it in exactly the same way. Now, it's important to remember that the condenser is basically there to stop wine droplets and wine vapour and VA making its way over to the H2O, because if you get any droplets of that going across, they're going to interact with the hydrogen peroxide and just basically add acid and give you a wrong result. So interpreting SO2 results. <clears throat> probably the most important thing to remember is changes in SO2 are probably as important, if not more important, than the absolute number. You know, what you're doing when you do SO2 results regularly, and that's what you should be doing, is looking to see if there's any changes. Because if there's no changes, it means there's probably nothing happening in your wine. But if you're seeing a change between the free and total ratio, what you're seeing is something's going on. So especially if you see your total going up and your free not going up, for instance, when you're adding free, um, that's suggesting that you've got lots of acetaldehyde being generated and that's changing. If you're seeing your free dropping off 
quickly, but you're not seeing any total. Once again, there's something going on in your wine, could be an oxidation problem, those sort of things. So probably the most important thing when you're doing ASO2 is to both monitor free and total and understand the interaction between them and also to do it reasonably regularly so that you're looking for changes in your wine. Because if you're not seeing any changes, that means you probably don't need to do anything. Now, preventing microbial issues is different to preventing oxidation, and that's where you've got to try to get reasonable molecular sulfur available in your wine. Now, traditionally, we talk about looking at 0.6 for red and 0.8 for whites. When you've got issues with breath, etc., we even like to bump that up a bit higher. Um, now, that is not something where you can say, all right, I'm going to stick with you know, 25 parts free because that will always give me 0.6 for my reds, whatever. Um, it doesn't work that way because if you get a different pH for your wine, you're going to see a different molecular, and so you need to take that into account. So for years where you see higher pHs in your wine, you're going to have to have a higher free sulfur level to get the same molecular and protect your wine. So pretty important to remember that relationship. And the other thing is, to, you know, you need a, a reasonable amount of SO2 available to mop up the oxidation products. Um, you can't just work on three or four parts, etc. In general, for white wines, we see that once three drops below ten, you know, we start to see a lot more damage. So it's always important to keep a reasonable level of SO2 in there. So stuff to remember when you're doing that. Um, SO2 binds to yeast really nicely. So if you're doing um, your SO2 additions right at the end of ferment or when you've still got a, quite a few yeast leaves and yeast there, um, the SO2 is going to bind to the surface of those. There's lots of carbonyl groups basically there. And so when you take away that um, those leaves, that those yeast cells, you're going to lose the SO2 as well. So if you're going to do SO2 adds to things with high solids, especially lots of yeast, then you're going to lose a fair bit of it and it's not going to be available for what's going on. It's much more effective to make a big, single big add post malo than lots of small ones. We've been talking about this for a long time at the AWRI, especially in relation to controlling Brettanomyces. Um, trying to just keep a lot of little um, Free and two and three part additions to um, your wine is not a really good way to do it because you're living on the edge all the time and you're not necessarily having enough there to ensure you've got a high molecular to prevent microbial problems and you're not going to have necessarily enough there to deal with any rapid changes that might take place because of oxidation or any of that kind of chemistry going on. So we think it's much, much more effective to put a big dose in early in the wine's life and then seal it up, make sure you don't get too much oxygen going in there unless you need it for other reasons and then manage it that way as opposed to trying to be just above your minimum level continually. Um, we see it's more effective. Yes, you may get some colour bleaching in reds initially but by the time you get to packaging and go into packaging and all that, if you've managed it correctly, it'll have dropped down and you'll get that colour back. It doesn't go away forever. Um, the legal limits for wine are generally based on total, not free, so you always have to manage your wine around that, which is why, once again, early additions are good because it gets in before you generate a lot of acid aldehyde through oxidation or microbial issues, and you don't see your free levels climbing up too badly. We say your total's climbing up too badly. Um, removing SO2 is really a pain um, if it's bound. Um, yes, there is an equilibrium. So if you're if you have a high bound SO2 and you get rid of the free by reacting it with hydrogen peroxide, you will slowly get SO2 moving back into the free form because it is an equilibrium. But it's such a slow process that um, it's just not realistic to do it easily. So much better to try to control it and not get to high total levels from the beginning because it's very hard to rescue the wine after the event. 
and during bottling, assume that you're going to lose about five parts at least due to TPO. So if you're, t which is total package oxygen, you know, not just the DO going into the bottle or the wine going to the bottle, but the oxygen in the closure and in the headspace. So if you are targeting 25 or 30 parts in bottle, you're going to have to start at least at 30 or 35 parts before you go into bottle. Um, it's just, it's always more important, I think, to try to reduce the oxygen ingress during cloak packaging, and if you can get a lot smaller drop off, that's great, but you really should keep it in mind to get your final targeted value. And our final one which we see happening lots and lots of times is never assume the tank you're adding to is homogeneous. You always need to mix it before testing. Wine tends to um, form layers in tanks especially, and especially if there's any solids at all there. If you're going to do an SO2 add, it's really important to mix and give it a chance to mix properly before you do a test because we see a lot of times people do do an addition test, oh nothing's changed, do addition test, nothing's changed, do another addition, oh now it's way over the limit, what's going on? And it's just because of the problems with it mixing homogeneously. So that's the quick overall talk about it. I'm going to very quickly touch on the worst of the problems with people doing aeration and oxidation aeration oxidation testing. I'm going to do this really, really quickly, but please ask questions afterwards or send emails. It's um it's a topic that goes on and on and on, so I'm more than happy to help people out with it. But for reagents, um, peroxide solutions go off in heat and light. Don't leave them on the windowsill. Don't leave them in um, bright light in clear bottles best thing, store them in the fridge when um, overnight and make them up fresh each week if you can. It really, really makes a big difference. Poor quality water gives really poor indicator colours and degrades the peroxide even more quickly. So, you know, definitely don't make it up from tap water. Get the best um, water you can to make up those reagents because it will make a big difference. Um, putting the indicator in your peroxides beforehand, you know, and lots and lots of people, including our lab, make, put the colour in there in the peroxide so we can just dispense it quickly, but that does mean it will go off more quickly, so you need to keep that in mind. Once again, make them up reasonably freshly, weekly is pretty good. Sodium hydroxide solutions, they change with time, it reacts with CO2 in the atmosphere, you need to check them relatively regularly. In the equipment, um, would you believe excess vacuum grease that some people use can initially absorb SO2? So if you take everything apart and put it on heaps of grease to try to stop any leaks, you're going to make the situation actually quite a bit worse. So if you're using vacuum grease, you've just got to use the absolute minimum you can. Um, also, if you decide you're going to give your sulfur rig a good washout, the um, detergent that residue that can be left behind can actually react with the SO2 as well, so you need to make sure it's really well rinsed out and it's not a bad idea to run some, um, some high sulphur wines quickly before you start doing your measurements just to um, cure the glassware properly. Um, positive pressure systems are, can leak, and that's a bit of an issue but you get much better gas balance through them or balance of the flows through them. Vacuum systems, on the other hand, don't leak, but it's much harder to make sure that all the systems have the same gas flow, which can lead to problems. So um, pros and cons for both. I've used both, and as long as they're well looked after and properly set up, they both work. Um, air bubbles and burettes, particularly in digital burettes, are one of the big common errors that we see when people are doing it. And if you've got a really high gas flow rate um, you and or you're boiling your solutions rather than just heating them gently, um, you get droplets of wine and VA carried over into your peroxide solution, which gives lots and lots of issues. And if you get a low gas flow, then you get you just don't get all the SO2 over and so you run into problems there. And technique wise, <coughs> Especially for freeze, if your wine is really, really cold, it quite it can give non-prop total carryover. Really, is good idea to bring it to room temperature. Also, when you're doing the bound or the total, you if it's really, really cold, it will take longer for it to heat up, and you might not give it enough time to go 
um, to unbind all those reagents, um, all the SO2. Adding orthophosphoric acid too soon before aspiration, in other words, I've seen a couple of labs where they've had problems because what they do is they line up six um, wine samples to go, then they go through and add the orthophosphoric to each of the reagents straight away, and then it's, by the time they get through the whole process, it's you know two minutes in. That um, will allow the SO2 just to escape to the atmosphere. So you need to sort of get your set up so that you add your orthophosphoric and put it directly onto the rig, not sitting around on the bench for any time at all. Blowing through bubbler tubes can add CO2 to the peroxide solution, gives you an incorrect result. And make sure you target a repeatable endpoint. The one that I'd like people to use is the slightly grey one on the top right hand corner. If you're in the either of the two bottom ones, as your target point, you can be over or at, under adding. And the other one that gets is a problem is the one where you can see that some of the purple stuff is still stuck up in the um, bubbler, which is why people blow through it, which is a bad idea. A bit of water is a better choice. So um, thanks for Patrick Island from these are straight from his book, those photos. And dripping wine into burettes, um, into the Bunsen burners for total, writes off more Bunsen's than I can ever describe. Um, it's a very simple fix. Before you take the um, the sample um, flask off the sulfur rig, move the Bunsen. Um, lots of people don't. Wine and juice drips into it and totally stuffs them. So that's the very, very quick troubleshooting for testing guide, and that's the end of the um, presentation. As I said, it's open now for questions and answers, and um, yeah, look forward to any comments.